Hey statists, we've got some questions for you. Hi, and welcome to our channel, The Realist Left. In this video, I will answer the 40 questions that libertarian YouTube bloggers had for a so-called status. Now, let me start off by pointing out the complete ridiculousness of the term status. It basically refers to anyone who believes in the existence of a state, or the 98 or 99% of the population who are not libertarian or anarchist, disregarding the fact that many self-identified libertarians themselves do in fact believe that some form of a state is necessary. No one actually identifies themselves as a status. It's simply a pejorative to otherize the ones not in this group. To me, this is kind of like gay men having questions for breeders, as if having heterosexual sex and the ability to reproduce is actually something to be ashamed of. It's just pure ridiculousness. I typically divide libertarians into three broad groups. The anarcho-capitalists, or anarchists, the minarchists, or minimal state libertarians, and the moderate libertarians, which usually within it contains some of the less progressive classical liberals out there. Now, I don't have much beef with the moderate libertarians or the classical liberals out there. You know, they may be wrong-headed in some areas. Their policies would lead to lower growth and less prosperity for nearly everyone in that society, in my view. But at least they're well within the realm of reality. And in fact, they're necessary, in my view, as a cautionary voice to make sure that the state isn't doing stupid things it shouldn't do. The other two are a bit more ideologically fervent. Minarchists are barely within the realm of reality, and only because they at least have historically existed, but it can at least be doubted that they're able to exist today within the community of nation states. These are the ones that would only want the bare basics of government, the enforcement of property rights, national defense and policing, law courts, and basic laws like laws against fraud to allow the existence of a marketplace to occur. Anarcho-capitalists are basically a self-contradiction, as they cannot exist in the real world, and to the extent that they can, it's only by refusing to revise downward the definition of a state or government to a local city-state, a tribal chief, a mafia boss, or a warlord who retains control over a certain area. Property rights do not exist in a stateless or governmentless society. You might have a claim to property in anarchy, but you would have no guarantee for it except by an entity willing to enforce those rights. Now, I discovered this video after watching Sargon of Akkad's response video, so I apologize if in any way I repeat his argument concerning Thomas Hobbes, the social contract, or any other argument he used. I'll also be using a bit of consequentialist ethical lines of reasoning in this video, and I'll give you a link of a decent outline of it within the description. I'll also be using a general post-Keynesian and MMT line of economic reasoning, so I'll give you a link to a decent primer to the monetary system in the description. With that being said, let's get started. If a kid couldn't afford lunch because the school bullies kept taking a percentage of his allowance, you wouldn't blame the kid's parents for not giving him enough. So why is it that when people struggle financially, you blame the employer who provides them with money and not the government which is taxing them? Well, this is a strange line of reasoning and logic to start out with, as if people in the developed world cannot afford their basic subsistence because the government is taxing them too much. I mean, we even had Mitt Romney in 2012 complaining about the 47% of Americans who were takers. Now, disregarding the fact that all the retired children, students, and overseas military uh, were among that 47%, the truth is that thanks to things like the earned income tax credits, the working poor in America actually receive more money from the government in income taxes than they paid in terms of taxes. So in other developed countries, they tend to have far more generous welfare states, so it really doesn't apply to developed countries at all. Now it's a different story if we're talking about developing nations, but that's more of a problem of not having the productive capacity and resources in your society to begin with. Also, it's well noted for classifying the government as a bully, but I guess that's just part of your general rhetoric. For fans of democracy, I would ask, is it okay to forcibly rob, control, or otherwise victimize somebody as long as the majority approves of it? Now, once again, with the silly and emotionally charged rhetoric, rob, 
I assume he means tax someone, but look at it this way. This person's property, income, prosperity, and general livelihood is only possible because the government he lives under protects his property with that terrible thing he calls force, or has its own currency and manages the economy of the country. If you live in a democratic society, then yes, taxation and laws are meant to pay for things like public goods, protection, the rule of law, because without those things, your property and money do not exist. People will take that shit away from you because there's no government to stop them. We all know that every economic system has market failures. Capitalism, socialism, communism, whatever. But my question is, why do you feel morally justified in forcing other people to subsidize these failures? Why should I be forced to subsidize failed electric car companies like Fisker or failed government initiatives like Obamacare? Shouldn't I have the right to decide what risk I want to take with my own money? Well, technically in some communist or Marxist-Leninist societies, they try to have no markets. But this is a disaster for obvious reasons that I won't go into that you probably agree with anyways. Aside from the general, you're in a democracy, or it's part of the social contract points that guys like Sargon have touched upon, it's important to point out that your own prosperity, your money, is only possible because of the success of other enterprises like GM, Microsoft, having a healthy financial sector, or because you're dealing with people who are not sick, disabled, or dead because they have health care from Medicaid or Obamacare, and thus are able to produce more, consume more, or stock the shelves at Target so that you could go and buy them. Why should you subsidize the public education of another? Because among other reasons, people and businesses would not be able to produce the goods and services that make our country rich if they were uneducated. Do you really want to live in an illiterate society like Afghanistan? Now, it's a reasonable question to decide whether it's a good idea to bail out or subsidize a certain company, industry, or public good like education or health care. But let me point out that even Pinochet using Chicago trained economists with Milton Friedman's blessing and training ended up bailing out and subsidizing large failing companies. How come you want to ban things that you don't like? As long as they're not hurting other people, what's the big deal? Now, I generally tend to be on the side of letting people do what they want as long as no harm is done. But there are broader things to be aware of, like banning polygamy because it's bad for society, and we could go into that, but also keeping basic public order with driving rules and driver's licenses so that people don't ultimately kill each other in accidents, or even basic enforcement of property rights. Why not trespass on or burn your fields down? You're not hurt from it, but of course, I'm sure you wouldn't agree with that status of the left, who are always talking about how government's going to help the poor and demarginalize marginalized groups. I don't understand this. From the ancient world through the Middle Ages all the way up to modern times, governments have largely conspired against the poor. I'm thinking in particular a century ago with eugenics programs and segregation programs and zoning programs and business regulation and union rules, everything was designed to exclude, marginalize, and impoverish groups that didn't have power. Governments are always controlled by rich people. That's just the way it works. Why do you think the government is the right means to help the poor? It makes no sense to me. Status again. Well, actually, this is a surprising Marxist analysis you have of governments, but you're kind of ignoring the development of democracies and how that plays a role in acting in our interests. In an oligarchy, the only interests are to retain power and to retain the interests of the oligarchs. In a feudal monarchy, kings and nobles have to retain their power by offering protection, upholding law and order, but not being a brute and keeping the people happy enough so they don't revolt. In an autocracy, the only interest is, is in keeping power. And of course, the only way they lose office is they die or they're overthrown. In a democracy, the elected government is beholden to the vote of the people. So if they do not do things that are in the public interest, or do things that the public wants, then they could be voted out of office. This is also yet another reason why living in the 20th and 21st centuries are far better than living in any century previous, because most governments are now democracies. So I punched this commie face in and said, how do you like those marks? <laughs> oh, we're recording.
does, does my hair look okay? <clears throat> How can you claim on one hand to be anti-guns, yet on the other hand, you want the state to take guns away at gunpoint? Pew pew! To your first point, guns are basically a powerful weapon that some countries have regulated to keep the number of deaths and injuries down. Though I would easily say that taking guns away in a country like the U.S. would be far more counterproductive than anything else, and probably lead to a bit of violence and insurrection, and I wouldn't advise it. Now as to why the state needs a monopoly of force, so that you don't take force into your own hands to settle disputes, because that ultimately leads to more violence, aggression, and death, just as it had in hunter-gatherer societies and medieval societies. Who Government has slaughtered 250 million of its own people in acts of democide. How can you trust such a beast to rule over you? And as some of you argue for, to be disarmed to. If one were misanthropic, you could instead rephrase the question, people have killed billions of other people in the act of homicide and genocide. But I suppose you choose to look only at nefarious governments, despite the government being an institution of leadership by people themselves, and said, each government is responsible for the actions of something every other government did in history, and that mark must be tarred all over it. Also, why is no credit given to governments for preventing wars from other groups of people by offering defense and protection? Why is it that no matter how much money the government takes from its citizens, it's always broke? Well, a country with its own free-floating currency, central bank, with debts denominated in its own currency, can never go broke. Read about how the modern monetary system works in the description. If keeping 100% of someone else's income is slavery, then at what percentage is it no longer slavery? This sounds like it's derived from this conservative libertarian theory that someone's freedom can be determined by what percentage they're taxed at. But either way, 100% taxation does not mean that you are enslaved, especially you have civil rights, and especially you voted for that commie in the first place. In any event, is there any society in the world today or any person out there actually advocating for this? Why are you even asking about a straw man like this? Can a bunch of people who don't have the right to do a certain thing grant to somebody else the right to do it? Uh, and if not, how did Congress acquire the right to do things that you and I don't have the right to do? Yeah, it's called passing legislation to legalize something that was previously prohibited. And Congress acquired this right through the Constitution, which the 13 states convened the right and passed within their respective states under the previous institution of the Articles of Confederation. I'm sure you know this. Why are you comfortable spending borrowed money knowing your children will have to pay it off down the line? You're increasing their eventual taxes before they can even vote. Isn't that the definition of taxation without representation? If you're talking about public debt, realize that from a purely accounting perspective, public debt is equal to private financial assets. So it sounds kind of crazy to be complaining about giving your children financial assets to sock your money away at interest rates higher than what you could get at banks, doesn't it? Look into sectoral balances. If people are so f***ing greedy and selfish that we need governments to steal from the rich and give to the poor and needy, then why do over 1.5 million charities exist globally, with 373 billion f***ing dollars being raised in 2015 alone? And that's not including the Clinton Foundation's money laundering operation. Alleged money laundering operation. 373 billion out of a total world GDP of 110.8 trillion in 2015? Yeah, you just made the point for me about why private charities cannot do the job that national welfare systems and foreign aid can do. And let's not forget how bloated with overhead these charities are that somehow libertarians conveniently ignore. You do realize that making something illegal won't make it go away. Guns, drugs, the black market will provide. Banning murder and theft won't make it go away. So why ban it at all? said no one. Obviously, it's to both reduce it and to make people suffer consequences if they do do it, so that they don't do it. Simple as that.
Here's some of the money government wasted. The government spent $1.4 million on an app that just simply points left and right for the TSA. That should have been done for way cheaper. Oh, that's not crazy enough for you? How about this? The government wasted $1.4 trillion on a jet that doesn't even work. That's enough to buy every homeless person in the United States a mansion. A $600,000 home. Oh, that's not crazy enough for you. The government lost $6 trillion. Knowing all of this, do you still think the government can spend your money more wisely than you can? The U.S. federal government also invested in the computer, the internet, the satellite, the GPS, the flat screen, the digital camera, digital data compression, voice recognition, the jet engine, Half of all new drugs created and three quarters of new generation drugs are financed by the public investment of nations. And the list goes on. We would not be communicating today without the research done by governments. But yeah, sure, white elephant projects aren't a productive use of public funds. But do you really think spending it on casinos or porn is all that much better? How can you rationalize basic philosophical concepts such as a non-aggression principle as being quote unquote too difficult for society to be educated on and abide by, yet believe that hundreds of thousands of pages of federal and state regulations, clauses, case files, and amendments are somehow easier? Because even with public socialization via the public education system, which you oppose, not everyone would agree on non-aggression. Besides, that's why we have lawyers, police, attorneys, accountants, and other compliance positions to specialize in just that. Why is it illegal for me to import my hedgehogs to a multitude of places, but it's totally legal to import thousands upon thousands of fighting age economic migrants? We can make hedgehog transportation legal just for you, Lauren. Also, I'm not a fan of open borders immigration, and yet many libertarians and ANCAPs like Milton Friedman and Murray Rothbard, are. If it's wrong for you to do a certain thing, can you, by voting, make it right for someone else to do the exact same thing? I think you're conflating morality with legality. Sure, I could think prostitution is wrong morally from an individual point of view, but then vote to legalize it because prohibition leads to worse results for women. If the competitive market ingenuity of capitalism can deliver us things like iPhones, 3D printers, and private spaceships, why should services as important as justice, roads, and defense be monopolized by the state? iPhones were mostly based on technology that the government first developed and financed, as previously mentioned, as are private spaceships. And the reason why we have public roads and national defense is because they are public goods in that they are non-rival and non-excludable, i.e. everyone has access to its benefits. You ought to read Machiavelli as to why mercenary armies are disastrous, destructive, and unreliable. Having to go through 15 tolls on the way to work would also really suck, take a lot of time, and be way more expensive than paying taxes to build those roads. Right-wing statists. When you're opposing gun laws, you argue the government shouldn't be so powerful that it can disarm the populace. So why, when it comes to drug laws, do you argue the government should be so powerful that it can tell people what they can put into their own bodies? This is actually not a terrible critique on conservatives' hypocrisy on the issue of freedom and liberty. But I'm sure overdosing on drugs and heroin does harm to other people, like to their children in the backseat of their car. Now, to status of the right, claim you're opposed to socialism and, uh, and, and don't see government as the answer, and yet invariably you're celebrating the cops, the first responders, and the, and the fire departments, and the jails, war, all big, all big public sector programs. It's a kind of a, the socialism that you love. Why do you think that that's going to work better than the private sector? Yes, conservatives love big authoritarian governments. But having private cops that enforce laws would be kind of like having the mafia as your police force. They protect you if you pay them, but not if the costs are too high, or if they have a more important client to think about. That's great. Money and might makes right. If people are innately good, what is the need for government? And if people are innately evil, what is to stop them using government to cause evil to one another? 
And would it not be better that their influence be limited to that which they can achieve voluntarily, rather than to give them the added benefit of legitimized force? There's only roughly 1% of people innately good and 1% innately evil. The laws are for us other 98% to hopefully make us closer to being innately good. Besides, I thought libertarians believed in self-interest, right? A major question that I have for proponents of state economic regulations in particular is how exactly can you sleep at night knowing the economic destruction that you have created? The effect of government regulations on output has been calculated to have an accumulated reduction cost on the American GDP of nearly $40 trillion dollars just since 1949. In other words, absent of any federal economic regulations after World War II, we could have tripled our GDP. Every citizen could have an average income of $333,000 instead of $53,000, a $277,000 increase in the average income. This doesn't even factor in the cost of compliance, rent-seeking, and state-level regulations. We could have had so much more prosperity and so much less poverty without state regulations on our economy. So how can you look your opponents in the eye and claim that your regulations are somehow for the common man? First of all, the study that you cite is a pretty good indicator of why mainstream neoclassical economics is not even remotely a science, and it's interesting to see some of the guys that Dawson and Cedar cited in their paper. Robert Barrow of the Ricardian Equivalents fame Alicina and Ardagna of the fame who study about the cases where austerity worked that all turned out to be a false misre- misrepresentation of the data. Anyways, while obviously bad re- regulations are bad and good government should get rid of all bad regulations, this study also implies that good regulations are bad too. So regulations that reduce environmental pollution and toxins from the air and water supply are simply burdensome and not itself leading to trillions in health and cleanup costs averted. Same thing with worker safety or of labor laws that basically end up paying higher wages than businesses otherwise would have paid, which increases demand and production. It also is in fact for in what role regulations could have to make other workers more productive and consume more than, say, a handicapped person now able to access the workplace and consume in the public shops and restaurants available. I suppose we could debunk this study more, but needless to say, it's highly flawed in serving a clear agenda. A better way to determine whether or not regulations are harming output is to calculate how much extra time is spent allowing for uh, approval for economic activity. So for example, how much time waiting for a license or environmental review approval versus how much it would have otherwise been and how much economic activity is wasted during that delay in approval. Lawyers and accountants, after all, are consumers too. Left-wing statists. When you're opposing drug laws, especially weed, you argue the government shouldn't be so powerful that it can tell people what they can and can't put into their own bodies. So why, when it comes to gun laws, do you think the government should be so powerful that it can have a complete monopoly over effective force? Because the monopoly of force ultimately reduces violence and crime. Small states during the medieval era are societies with the largest rate of death. You should look into Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan as well as Steven Pinker's Better Angels of Our Nature about why monopolization of force by the state is necessary to reduce violence and does. Here are the things you can't do without government permission. Build a house, drive a car, own a gun, go fishing, collect rainwater, hunt, cross the road, get married, leave the country, start a business, fly on a commercial plane, take drugs, work. It's actually hard to think of something that doesn't require government permission. Knowing this, how can you say you're free? A lot of those regulations are there for a reason, of course. Building a house with certain building codes so that it doesn't set itself on fire and burn down other homes or get destroyed during an earthquake or hurricane. Having a driver's license so that a person has minimal competence in driving and not kill other people while driving. Not jaywalking so that you don't get hit and maybe die or damage another car's property when they hit you. These are closer to common sense things rather than some tyrannical prohibition that prevent us from being free. Besides, 
Our country lets us into others. It's other countries that wants to know who the heck they're letting into their country, unless you're North Korea, of course. If being a democratically elected constitutional republic creates legitimate political authority, does that mean that all the things that were done by the democratically elected constitutional republics of the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and North Korea, all those things were legitimate and justified? Those are not democracies. They are totalitarian governments that suppressed any kind of democracy. Next. If you're a proud, government-loving liberal who champions personal choice, could you please explain why I can't choose to not fund the murder of innocent children abroad? Government-loving liberal says no liberal ever. Not to mention they're typically the ones also most against foreign interventionism that you complain about. This is a question better directed to conservatives, but I would say their explanation is that so that they don't come here and murder you and your children. If you've ever said there ought to be a law, or if you believe that government is the best solution to most of life's problems, I have one question for you. Are you prepared to kill? Every law, no matter how big or small it appears to be, is backed by violent force, and in many cases, death. I suppose because I support the existence of police enforcing laws. Let me pose a question to you. Are you willing to kill any and everyone who might come and take your property in a state of anarchy? Because that happened a hell of a lot more. You really want the same people who run the DMV to be in charge of your health care? Funny story. I went to a DMV center maybe 10 years ago. It was practically an in and out situation. I went to the same place three years ago for a new driver's license, waited more than an hour, and met a woman complaining about government efficiency, and that she came from a county away, something like 80 miles away. Turns out, the state closed her DMV due to statewide budget cuts. So you get what you pay for. And also, most countries have private providers and hybrid public-private systems. Do you really think elderly people do not enjoy their Medicare? Or as one town hall protester complained in 2009, keep your government hands off of my Medicare. Why is it that you prefer anti-discrimination laws which force those who hate other races to hide that prejudice and make money off of those other races to a system where they could be open about said prejudice and lose money? Because in a society that openly discriminates and segregates, the opposite would happen, and businesses would lose money if they chose not to discriminate, which is exactly what happened during the South under Jim Crow. You guys often say that libertarians have too much faith in the goodness of people. Why then do you in the same breath argue that I give up my right to bear arms and entrust my personal safety to police and gun-free zones? That seems like pretty strong faith in human nature to me. Well, it's a decent point to say that there could be bad cops too, but at least ideally, they are to be held accountable. But far too often, they are not. And this is why I support the early wave of holding the police to account before Black Lives Matter and its radicalism and post-structuralism and radical feminism and craziness showed up to the scene. Status, since the war on drugs has been an absolute failure, what makes you think a war on guns would be any different? I generally don't see a war on guns as being anything but a failure if it were to happen, and see it more as a distraction issue by elites like Michael Bloomberg. Can you morally justify the federal government preventing a small territory from seceding from a larger country? Good philosophical question, I would say. No, not really. But the problem is it might lead to more violence than it's worth, like, say, the American Civil War or the Balkan Wars. But not always. How is me writing down, I'm in charge, and then getting 20 friends to sign it, any different from the drafting of the Constitution. Because those 20 guys aren't the delegates from self-governing colonies or states. If roads are so complicated and magical that they can only be built by governments, then why do they hire private companies to actually build the c***s, eh? My fucking roads! So, are you saying that you want a state-owned construction company to build them instead? Anyways, not a completely terrible idea to have around 
as long as it could compete with private companies too for the best costs and best products. Why is every logical explanation we provide about how something will work just pure speculation while any doomsday scenario you pull out of your ass about anarchism is absolute truth? A big reason is that your utopias never have really existed, and when anything comes close to it, they're an absolute disaster in practice. How highly do you think of yourself that you think it's your right to impose your views on people you've never met and tell them it's good for them? I do hope you realize that forcing everyone to live in an anarchy and not a structured society is truly one of the most imposing things that one can do, since we are humans after all. Listen to this ridiculousness. We protect our president with guns, but our children with paper gun-free zone signs. Congress has a 9% approval rating. Government can't even balance a budget. We are about to reach a $20 trillion debt. Social Security and Medicare and other socialist policies are unsustainable. The drug war kills more people than drugs itself. How can you say government is effective? <laughs> Why is defending the president with guns irrational? Or not wanting kids to bring guns to school bad? A government balancing the budget is generally a terrible idea unless inflation is heating up and you need to take money out of the economy. That's also called $22 trillion in private net financial assets, which sounds pretty nice if you ask me. No, Social Security and Medicare are completely sustainable and to infinity because the federal government cannot run out of money unless it does something dumb like go on to a gold standard or a euro. And no, as bad as the drug war is, drugs kill a lot more people than the war itself. Opioids have been killing more people than guns or car accidents for the last two years. Now, to the status of the left and right, who are, in, are, are constantly against free trade and, and promoting protectionism and warlike uh, foreign, foreign trade policies, why is it that you think trade between nation states is any different between, from trade between states in, in the U.S., between you know, Vermont and New Hampshire or Georgia and Mississippi, which we understand is a good thing because it broadens the division of labor and makes everybody better off. Why do you not see that that's also true internationally? And why do you think a solution to this non-problem is to raise taxes on the American people? Because New York and Alabama are held to the same federal regulations, same federal taxation, same federal government that could spend in these states and have the same currency, whereas we are not with other nations. If New York outcompetes Alabama, which it does, then the federal government can spend in Alabama on welfare or on space centers, like it does today, so that Alabama as a state isn't completely impoverished. I'll make a video in the future about free trade and why Ricardian comparative advantage is a load of crap, but basically trade is bad between two countries when they run surpluses and deficits against each other. A trade deficit country leads to a loss in demand and income, usually in the manufacturing sector, that has to either be made up in public spending, private debt accumulation, or in lower savings rates nationally, all of which Austrian libertarians tend to hate. The trade surplus countries on the other hand, get to buy up the deficit country's assets. When an individual's moral conscience conflicts with the commands and rules of lawmakers and law enforcers, is an individual morally obligated to do what they believe to be wrong simply to obey the law? This is a bit more on conflation of what is legal and what is moral. But if you disobey the law, then expect to face consequences. You keep saying I have to be moral by voting for a lesser evil this year. Could you please explain how any kind of evil is ever moral? Well, I personally don't like people who morally shame someone into not voting for the person they want to, but not strategically voting does have consequences, and the quote-unquote lesser evil tends to mean the person that better represents your views and or would make a more competent leader. And there's not a whole lot of problem with strategically voting. Given my first question to right-wingers and my second to left-wingers, comparing drug rights, which half of you advocate, and gun rights, which the other half of you advocate, it seems to me that there are two possible compromises. Either we go full authoritarian and none of you get what you want, or we go full libertarian and you can both have what you want. 
Which sounds more appealing to you? And given that answer that you gave, don't you think there are one or two other issues we could apply this reasoning to? If I had to choose all libertarian, as mentioned previously, and no, black and white thinking is never a good thing. Well, that's it for this video. I'll probably make some other videos about libertarianism in the future, especially if I get a lot of response from libertarians from this one. And I'll definitely make a video about free trade as well. So thank you for watching. Keep it real and keep it left.